Cool. Has anyone had a chance to look at the YouTube videos? Are they okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah enough reasonably clean. Yeah. You do, and I don't think there's any point not doing this, but you do do the thing where you gesticulate in the air and you're like, look at this data. And if you're looking at the YouTube video, you're just like, oh, yeah, I have to remember to do that. I, I got quite good at that in Shmi, but I keep forgetting this one. Uh, it's, it's not the end of the world because anyone watching the YouTube videos, they're missing out on the um, that's not the one. Do do do. Do 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 do. That's that's the one I want. Um, just some prelim. Friday we have our first workshop. Your prereqs for the workshop. You really need to bring a laptop or bring a friend who has a laptop. Because I want to actually have a go at working through these things. What I started doing, um, and this may or may not work, is I've written a little function that actually goes through the workshop and works out all the packages I do. So you can come with the packages already done. So for this week's workshop, if you don't already have it, you need to install R. There's the link. Go to CRAN to get R. I highly recommend you get the latest version of R Studio. You can actually get a development version of our studio if you want to try some of the newest stuff. It's what I use, but you know, that's fine just getting our studio. If you don't know about it, the Pac-Man package is great. <coughs> the Pac-Man package is for package management. I discovered this a whole Saturday ago. But what it lets you do is you can go Pac-Man and you go P-Load. And the nice thing is if you put this in, and you have the packages, it loads them. If you don't, it attempts to install them, then loads them. So it's a one-stop, easy way of doing it. So I've written a function that produces this for each one. So you'll find that one of the first slides for each workshop will just give you what command to run. So you should be able to, once you have Pac-Man installed, copy, paste that, run it. You know you've now got all the packages ready to go. So for this week, if you don't have it, you need Tidyverse. Four cats is really good if you're messing around with factors. Uh, read Excel, if you're going to read in Excel spreadsheets, the micro benchmark, because we're going to do a little bit of early profiling, comparing two functions to show which one's faster. Um, Gapminder, which has the Gapminder data. If you don't know about Hans Rosling and Gapminder, go and search it on YouTube. One of the best communicator statistics has ever been. Unfortunately, he passed away about a year and a half ago. Um, his book, um, all about statistics analysis, uh, and I can't remember the book at the moment, it's just brilliant. It came out last year, highly recommend it. Uh, and Broom for having these nice tidy packages. So, lecture four. So last time we looked at regression. So the whole idea of the regression models, and it was a recap, was that we have a quantitative response variable with features that we want to basically get a model between the two. And we talked about things about, you know, typical questions we can ask, how you fit the model. Once you've got a fitted model, how you can say, does the model make any difference? So comparison with an F-test. We also looked at individual choice of models, and we'll get into more detail of that. And um, then we talked about, we sort of did assumption checking, but where things can go wrong. Things like collinearity, um, heteroscedasticity, correlation between your... Um, error terms, all these things we addressed. Hopefully for most of you it was a recap, but it's always good because a lot of these techniques use this. Uh, you know, when we get to ridge regression, the sue regression, splines, the underlying structure is a linear model. Now we're going to look at classification over the next two lectures. So now the main change is our response variable is a categorical variable or qualitative variable. So, here we are. In classification, we are attempting to predict a categorical response variable. Nice and easy. So, I'm going to start with logistic regression. One, it's the first port of call for most classification problems. I'm um, assuming that the majority of you have seen logistic regression before, but I'm still going to recap it because, again, we often compare things back to logistic regression. It's a good idea to recap. Stephen? So, we'll have a motivating example. So, what I've got here is I have T 
two predictors, income and balance. And what I'm trying to do, this is the credit data that's built into the package that comes with the intro stats book. What I'm trying to do here is predict whether you default on a loan. So by default is you fail to pay it back. So what I've done here is each dot is a loan. For each loan, we know the balance of that loan, the income of the person who took that loan, and whether they defaulted or not, and we've colored it. The problem is there's a lot of points, and there's a lot of overlapping points, you can't quite see it very well. So what I did is I did a quick, and if you don't know about this, a hex type figure. So it just shows the patterns a little bit better. So again, I have two features. I have the balance and I have the income. And now the hexes, you can see, they're still overlapping, but you can start to see that generally towards the right, as you get a bigger balance, people are more likely to default, which sort of passes the stupidity test. If I borrow a lot of money and I can't afford to pay it back, you know, that's where you're going to default more. But, you know, is there a relationship there? So let's think about logistic regression. For those that don't know, logistic regression is in the framework of models called general linear models. So if you think about a linear model we did last time, the whole idea is you had this sort of linear combination of the features. You had a noise term, which we often assume is normally distributed, and you have this response variable, which takes a number. And if you start to think about the number, it can take any number. There's nothing about the model that says, you know, I think my response variable should lie between zero and one, or it should be positive, or it should be an integer. It basically says, if I take my features, it's a linear combination of that, so my response variable can take anything on the real number line. Also, the standard thing is we've got this very simple noise structure. We've got the epsilon we added at the end, and often we assume normality. And general linear models said, let's adapt this. I would like to model something more than normally distributed data. I'd like to model something more than just lies on the real number line. I would like to model things like counts. I would like to model things like probability of success. So basically they took the ideas of the linear model and said, how do we adapt it to take into account distributions like the binomial, the Poisson, the beta binomial, all these other distributions. And this is a common story is we start with linear regression and we have that framework and we go, how do we adapt it to now deal with more scenarios? So you can think about your general linear model as consisting of three parts. First of all, you're going to have a distribution of the observations. So previously, obviously, our observations have often been normally distributed. But I could have a distribution where they could be have a binomial distribution, a Poisson distribution, a general distribution. And they're going to have a linear model part. I really like that idea of that linear combination of the features that we had before. You know that beta zero plus beta one, x one plus beta two, x two. So I'd like to keep that. But the final thing is I need something that's going to link the two parts and make sure. So for example, if I'm gonna predict the probability of success, I need to make sure my probabilities lie between zero and one. If I'm gonna predict, you know, the uh, parameter in a Poisson, I need to make sure we have counts. So your link function is basically in there to ensure that connection between the linear combination part, the linear model, and my distribution. So let's give the example of logistic regression. So my distribution is, I'm now gonna say that my yi, which is a count of the number of successes, is going to have a binomial distribution where we have a number of trials, ni, and we have a probability of success, pi i. So each, each little experiment is a little binomial. Obviously, you can get Bernoulli by just setting ni equals to 1 and doing it that way. My linear model is I'm going to have a linear combination of my features. And my link function, there's more than one link function, but the canonical link function for this particular distribution is what we call the logit. Basically, what that's doing is saying, even though this linear model could produce anything on the real number line, once it's gone through this, my pi i's will always lie between zero and one. They will strictly lie between zero and one with that particular model. And that's your logistic regression, named because this thing here is a logistic function.
And you can rearrange it and you can actually say if I took that model in that form, I can now work out the probability that xi equals 1 or xi equals 0 in the case that yi is a Bernoulli. And you could do it also for your different ones in a binomial. And all I've done is I've taken this in the case where ni equals 1 and I've just rearranged it to get that form. Okay. How do I estimate the parameters in that? So my parameters in this problem now, if we go back and look at this, are the beta zero up to the beta p. One thing that you have to make a mistake is you go, normally you go, well, my parameters are model and my betas, and then I've got that sigma term. <coughs> Notice you don't have a sigma term in here. You have variability, but your variability is all described within that distribution. If you think about it, when it comes to the variability of yi, because this is binomial, it's just going to be ni times pi i times 1 minus pi i. You don't need a, a sigma. It's pretty well built in. Your um, binomial is a one-parameter model. And in fact, if you've done logistic regression, you'll often have this idea of, because it's a one-parameter model, when you estimate your parameter, you should be able to get the mean. It's ni pi. You should be able to get the variance, ni times pi times 1 minus pi. And occasionally what you do is you get your data and you look at it and go, wait a minute, when I look at the variability, there's more variability than I expect with that ni pi i or minus pi i, or what we call over dispersed data. So then you go and say, well, I need a two parameter model. I need something better than the Bernoulli. So you do something like a negative binomial, et cetera. So just in case you've ever heard of over dispersed, that basically says I have one parameter but it's not explaining both the mean and variance in adequate terms for this data. So I need a model that have, can take into account that extra variability I observe in the data, which is over dispersed data. But anyway, that's the side. So I've got to estimate beta zero to beta p, the best fit that data. How are we gonna do it? Well, first of all, you can write that the log likelihood is equal to this. It's a summation as i goes from 1 to m. By m, I meant n, but they're so close together on the keyboard and I was typing too fast, is of this form. I've introduced a thing called eta to make it a little bit easier, where eta i is that log of pi i over 1 minus pi i. Okay. So the problem is, for some of you that would be familiar, you've done stats modeling and you should have seen this before. For some, it seems to have come out of nowhere. I suddenly went, we've got a binomial, and ta-da, and I got to that. In a second, I will show you the ta-da, so you can make sure that what I've done makes sense. But once I've got this likelihood, then I could basically differentiate it with respect to the each of the betas. So I'm going to take the score function by differentiating with respect to the parameters, Set that to zero and solve and get my maximum likelihood estimators. Fair enough. And again, I'll have a little bit of a ta-da in a moment. And I explain that you can write the score as this very nice thing. I take my design matrix. I take the transpose of it. I take my observed data. And my observed data in this, remember, will be a uh, just an integer in the case of a binomial or just a zero and one in case of a Bernoulli minus my mu is my expected value of that. It would be my NIPI for that individual. So you're just looking at the difference between what did I observe in this? I did 10 trials, I got five, but in my case, perhaps my PI was 0.25. So I expected I should have got 2.5. So I got five minus 2.5, it fits in there. You could then go and solve that. Unfortunately, there's not a nice analytic solution to this, unlike with our linear regression, we knew that beta hat equals x transpose x to the minus one x transpose y. You're not gonna get that quite nicely. So we need to optimize it. We need to sort of explore that space and try an infinite number of values of our betas to find the one that gets this as close to zero as possible. Just while we're here, you can also get your Fisher information. You can show that your Fisher information, in this case, is x transpose dx, where d is a matrix with a really nice form. It's 
basically a matrix that's nearly zeros everywhere, except for it has the variance you would expect for a binomial along the diagonal. Okay. So I gave you a lot of slides there. Now let me add the ta-da to understand why this works. So here's my notes. Of course, I will make these available for you if you want them. I've large taken them up because my whiteboard is hard to use. And even if I could use it, as I've said before, that would mean you'd have like two things you don't understand. How this works, and then all the shit I put on the board that you can't read. It's the exponential process of teaching in statistics. Let's think about how we do it. Let's go through it. Some of you have seen this before, but it's still nice to see. So let's start with our probability mass function of a binomial. So I've got altogether m individual trials. And in each trial, I have a load of trials within it. So I've repeated an experiment m times. Each time, I have so many trials, I count the number of successes. Yeah? So the classic one is the beetles. They took beetles each time. They'd expose the beetles to a different concentration of pesticide. And they'd count how many beetles died. Just because, yeah, statisticians are sick fuckers. But, you know, what else are we going to do? So here you've got your ni choose yi. So this is the number of ways of getting them successes. You've got your probability on your ith trial of a success, so the yi. So this is your number of successes. Here's your failures. In our case, the beetle lived. We counted that as a failure. I told you, sick fuckers. So 1 minus the pi to ni minus yi. You take this. The product of the thing is because I'm doing more, I'm doing M trials. So it turns out the M was right. I dissed myself and I was wrong. The M was right. Can't believe you all questioned me. Bastards. So we take the product because we're going to assume these trials are independent. So what's the first thing to do? We take the log like this. So we take the log. So here I've taken the log. So I've got yi log pi i. N minus yi log 1 minus pi i plus some nasty little term that I don't really care about because it's going to be constant when we come to respect the betas, so it's going to disappear when I differentiate. All I've done here is I've brought the yi terms together. And then I've got the ni term here. Yep, yeah? and I've still got that term here. Finally, I've said that log of pi i over 1 minus pi i will define as e to i. So that's fine. I've replaced it there. This comes from this logic here. I know that e to i equals this. So I can rearrange to get the pi i. I can do 1 minus, and then I can take the log, and I can simplify the log. And this becomes my constant. So this is my log likelihood. So I want to basically get the maximum likelihood estimators of that. So I'm going to take that log likelihood, differentiate it with respect to the beta j's, and put it equal to zero. So what do I want to do? I want to do dl over d beta j for each of my betas, one to p. So I'm going to do chain rule. Here's my chain rule. I differentiate this with respect to eta, no problem, and then I do d eta with respect to d b j over all the possible cases. Just so you know, here is one of the terms. And if you actually go back and look at this, if I differentiate back to eta, this is just yi. This is minus ni. And then I've got eta, e to the e to i over the 1 plus e to the e to i. So I get this. And all I've done is I've taken this term, this is the pi i, so I've replaced it. So here is my observed data point. And here, if you notice, is the expected value of a binomial with ni trials and probability success pi i. I still need to get this term, the eta i to the beta j. Well, the relationship between the eta, remember, is that link function. Eta is just x times beta. That's my linear combination. If I now differentiate that, I just get my x. 
And this times this is the equivalent of doing x transpose y minus this, and this is now in the vector form. Where our mu i equals n i pi i, and our pi i is defined by this e to i. Remember, as long as your distribution is sufficiently nice, and most distributions from an exponential family, which is pretty well everything you ever see, are sufficiently nice, then we know that the Fisher information can be written as the variance of the score. So I take my score, here's in its vector form, or matrix form, so I'm just going to take the variance of that, and the rules we learned right in the very first lecture, now come back, we know that the variance of x transpose this is x transpose the variance of y, x. You might go, where does the eta, that's considered to be a constant in this case, the only real random variable is our yi. So the variance of any random variable plus a constant is just the variance of that random variable. So you get x transpose d, because the variance of y is this d, which we defined as the variance along the diagonal. Cool. Any questions of that? So the question is, why are we doing this? I like to think of it as daycare. I keep you off the streets for at least an hour, so all the professors can get to their coffee shop a lot earlier. But the other reason we're doing this is we're going to have lots and lots of machine learning methodologies little black boxes that we're going to keep getting out and going, I've got this scenario, what should I use? And I get the black box. But what you should do is you should break open the black box. Every time you see a black box, the first thing you do is sort of break it open and try and look at the underlying mathematics. Why is it the way it is? Why is it fitted that way? How does it work? Because the foundational mathematics means that if you need to improve it in the future, you can. The steps we did here now will give us press on regression if you really wanted to, if you think about it. The only thing I'm doing in a second is, once you've broken open, you've looked at the mass, and you made sure you can do the mass, and you feel that that foundation is good, the next thing you should do is go and could you implement it yourself? Because until you can do the maths yourself and you can implement it yourself, you don't really understand any of these methods. Up until that point, you're just a black box user. So as I said, you can't actually get the answers to this. So we're going to use an optimization method. And we're going to use the optimization you saw in first year, which was the Newton method, which is you get your new guess by basically taking your guess minus off your slope times a little bit. And here is what it's called the Newton maps. And I'm going to say my estimates at the t plus one step is my previous estimates in the previous step minus I've got a the equivalent of a slope term, which is the first derivative of my score, and the actual value of my score function at that point. So this is the newton raphson method. Basically, if you look at it, it's a Newton method. And the Newton method is a standard way of solving, you know, um, trying to find the roots of functions. We don't use that, we use a thing called the Fisher scoring. We've replaced that inverse of the Hessian by the expected value of that, which is the Fisher information. And it's now called Fisher scoring. And if you go through, and I haven't done it this time, and look at it, you can actually rewrite it and say that my estimate of my beta at the t plus one stage is my previous estimate, plus I've got this very nice term. Here is the fish information, which we derived. I'm just going to take the inverse. Here is the score function, and I'm going to evaluate both the d and the mu using the parameters of the beta t. And I just update. So you start with a guess, and you're updating at each point, slowly improving. Any questions so far? And obviously, you would keep improving your coefficients until you don't get any improvement in the estimate by some tolerance level that you're happy with. How do you start? Well, often this is the one that they do, is they solve this very simple equation where you replace your y in a linear regression by log of your number of, of, um, number of successive plus 0.5. 
and your number of failures plus 0.5. The 0.5 is to deal with the fact you might have trials where you have either all of them successes or none of them successes. So the 0.5 just takes that into account. So you don't try and take the log of a zero. So let's look at an example. Let's go back to these beetles. So the beetles, what they did is they ran a load of altogether eight experiments. For each experiment, they would take so many beetles. So for example, in the first experiment, they took 59 beetles. They exposed them to 1.69 concentration of pesticide. And out of these 59, six died. And they tried different. And what you notice is as the concentration increases, more beetles die. Okay. So what's the relationship, you know? If I want to kill so many beetles, if I want, for example, the LD50, which is the dose of, of a pesticide or any drug at which 50% of the things will die, it's a lethal dose 50. You also do it in a lot of drugs when you give them in pharmacology, they will have a, a lethal dose to let you know that yes, this antibiotic is fine, but the lethal dose, if you actually gave this dose, this is a dose at which 50% of all people will die. Most drugs have an LD50, just so you know. So I decided to implement it. I'd actually never done this before. I'd always just done the logistic command directly in R, but I thought, I've got the functions, let's actually do it. And I highly recommend you have a go. It, it gives you, implementing any function gives you a sense of what are the tricks, what is it, the things you're not taking into account that you miss until you start doing it. So let's look at this function. So the initial point is going to take my vector of successes, my vector of number of trials, and my design matrix X. And here you've got your V, the log of Y plus 0.5 over N minus Y. So the number of successes plus 0.5. Remember this is doing a vector calculation, so this would be a whole vector of them. It's dividing and then it's taking the log and solving. Then to get my B to zero, I basically do this solve command. So if you don't know to do inverses in R, you use solve. To take transpose, you just take the T of the X. And we've already discussed before, to get the matrix multiplication, you do percent times percent. And then I return it. So to create my X, I had I did a C bind, to, did a column bind. I've got a row, a column of ones for my intercept, and then the beta concentration. So I'm basically going to get a two column matrix with ones and concentration. Get my B to zero. So here's my first estimate of my intercept and my slope in that logistic regression model. So the next thing I do is I'm going to write myself a little update function. So here's my update function. It takes my BT, my Y, my N, and my design matrix. So the first thing I do is I calculate the eta, which is the X times BT. So that's the, the linear combination part in that thing. I then calculate pi, which is the expect of eta over one plus. Then I calculate my mu and I calculate my diagonal. And then this equation is directly from that slide. Because we've written out the mass and we understand the mass, we can just write that line and then it returns it. So there to show that it works, I put in my data and it updates it. So I've got my starting point, I've got my updating point. I just need now a wrap round that's just gonna Flip through this until it doesn't get any improvement. So here we are. I started with a distance of infinity because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my guess so far and my new guess and I'm going to keep updating it until they get close enough that I don't care. So I work out the distance between each of these values where my distance is basically the Euclidean distance. So. I set my new one to my old, I get a new one here, I compare the distance, I spit it out and I keep going while that distance is greater than 0 0.01. I run it and here's my steps, all done. Why 0.01? Uh, why not? Because if I went too small it wouldn't fit on a slide and also I tried it until I got answers that were similar to what I got. Um, roughly this says I'm happy to one decimal place, roughly. 
Um, but once once I tested it, if I really was going to use this, although I would never use this, I would now change this to something like 0.0000001. Think about how many decimal places that I care about and just do it a couple more than that. Here's how you do it in R. So why did I bother with the implementation? Because I wanted to understand the Fisher scoring. And you really don't understand algorithms till you implement them. There's something about doing the math with a pencil and writing the code in R that makes you understand an algorithm. There's something about, it's the difference between passive and active. You know, the number of times you will watch a lecturer do a proof and you think, nailed that, absolutely got that, that is so fucking cool. And then we put you in the exam and go, have a go, and you go, fuck. Because you haven't actively had a go. The same with algorithm, you look at an algorithm, there's a sense of, you don't understand what the objects are, you don't understand that this is actually a vector, it wasn't a scalar, you didn't realize that that was bold until you start to implement it. And so you start to implement it, you get an aha moment, a sense of ownership. But once you do that, never fucking use it. We are all, all of us, bad coders. And we will never code as well as the people who actually made the GLM function. They took your implementation of the code and made it fast and safe and really, really good. So you do the maths. You do the implementation, you check your implementation to make sure you got your understanding right with their implementation, then use their implementation because they know how to code so much better. We are not computer scientists, we are statisticians and we can code, but we can't code like they can code. So here's how you'd actually do it in R. We're going to use the GLM package for general linear model. It's a little bit complicated. The form that it wants in the GLM model for the case where we're doing binomial is it wants a matrix where the first one is the successes and the second one is the failures. Typical gotcha of logistic regression. We all have to look it up, we all forget. I'm going to regress that on concentration. I tell it where the data is and I now need to let it know because general linear model will do all sorts of things which family I'm doing. I'm doing family equals binomial. It goes and runs it. I get a summary. Here's the information of what it did. It took four iterations to score in the Fisher scoring, which is not too bad. Mine was three, but it probably went to more levels of tolerance. Now, instantly you have a question in the back of your mind is, because we've implemented it and we thought about it, you go, well, what tolerance did the built-in one do? doesn't tell you that. I don't believe it tells you that. So now you know, because you implemented it, to go back and say to the GLM and look in the help file, what's the tolerance you did? Did it do 0.01 or maybe it did more? So it's worthwhile doing. Here's its results. The minus 60, 34. Here's my results, minus 60, 34. So my implementation worked, so I'm really happy. But this gives us more. We can now ask the things like, is there a significant relationship between the probability of success of the pesticide and the concentration? Yes, we've got our p-value of less than two times 10 to the minus 16. There's a significant relationship. You've got the stars. There's no stars. I will so take them out of the exam. I've done it once with you and I will do it again. Stop looking at the stars. No stars. It's not astrophysics. Stats. Look at that number there. But for those who like stars, we got the three stars. You're now famous. The second time I taught Shmi, I also took off the stars. And they said, why did you do that? And I said, I did that because of Anthony. The relationship is a positive number. So what does that mean? As concentration goes up, do you kill more or kill less beetles? Yeah. The logistic, if it's positive, the probability of success increases as you increase the predictor. Negative means it would decrease. Yeah. There's no success is killing. Yes. Because we're sit fuckers. Yeah. So I went back to the loan one. So now I'm going to look at the probability of defaulting on balance and income. Now the nice thing is it's a Bernoulli. I don't need to do that complicated structure of I have a set of trials, failure, successes. 
Basically, each observation I now have a success or a failure. All the rest is set up. We get our interpretation here. You can see there's a significant effect. It's now getting harder and harder to actually interpret what the relationships are. So I'm going to look at visualization. So first of all, what I've got here is I've got the balance on the x-axis. I've got whether you defaulted or not, yes or no. The actual red are the observed values. So there are only two possibilities, yes or no. And what we see here is the predicted. Now the problem you see here is when it comes to predicted, I'm actually working out the predicted value for all the observations, for example, here that had a balance of 2000, which is lots of them. You've got the extra predictor in there. You've got this spread there. But you can see generally as we increase the balance, we go from the probability is pretty well low or zero of defaulting and it goes up. The relationship here of income is just not as obvious, is it? I mean, it's interesting, like, the model said there was a significant relationship, it's really quite strong. But it's very hard to see the relationship in this. Mm. In fact, I did find it so hard, I actually went back and thought, I'll have a look at another way of looking at the relationship. So if you don't know about it, there's a really nice package called effects. And it has this term all effects really really good for quickly looking at models if you just go plot all effects and you give it a model it will give you a big spit out of plots showing all the relationships between the features and the response variable you're interested in what it does is it takes each response variable and then what it does is it takes every other feature and sets it at the average level and then it looks at values a grid of values on that <coughs> first response variable while everything else is kept at the mean. You can actually grab the data out. Um, you've got to do this command here, where you can do the all effects. This spits out a very weird data frame structure. You can grab it out of the list, and then you can convert it to a tibble so you can get a ggplot. Great for any complicated model for um, having a look at the relationships. But what I've done here is I've now got the balance. I've now got the probability of defaulting. I've put some error bars on there as well. And what it's doing is it's saying this is the relationship between balance and the probability if I keep income at the average. What I've done here is I said how many levels I wanted points wise. If you don't, it will just find all the unique levels and do it. It's a really nice command. I use it a lot. But what you can see now is you can see there's actually a beautiful relationship. And roughly, if your balance is 1000 let, you're probably not going to default. And then as it gets bigger and bigger, you get more and more. So once you get to 2,000, you're pretty well guaranteed to default. Do the same here. And you can see the problem with your income is, one, you've got very wide bands. And also, be careful. This is not 0, 1. This is 0 0.002 to 0 0.008. There is a significant relationship between income and your probability of defaulting but it's not an important relationship. You definitely see there's a relationship, but it's, you know, significant does not mean important. I hope someone told you that at some point, up until this point. So how can we actually improve this? What if we had more than two response classes? What if we had the case where we have what we call a multinomial distribution? So instead of success or failure, you have, you know, three or more levels in your categorical variable. Well, we can do multinomial regression. What we do now is we choose one class as our reference case, usually, the, in this case, the, the, the final level. And now we do everything. Instead of doing the logic of success versus failure, you're doing the probability of this class versus the probability of your reference class. So everything's compared with that. So you can still see it looks very, very similar. Now your distribution will be multinomial. So the general version of the binomial. You're going to do everything. Now your link function is going to relate it to your reference case. You've still got your nice linear combination in here. You could rearrange it and show that, again, if I wanted the expected value that my i observation is in the J class given my data, 
you get a form that should look very similar to the one we saw with the logistic regression. And again, now if I want the final case, because all these probabilities should up to one, you just get a one there and it falls out. Here's an example. You do this using the NNNet package. Uh, and there's some data here that I got from the car package, which was uh, a review done in Canada in the 80s looking at women, whether they were in full-time, part-time, or not in the labor force, looking at household income, etc. So what I've done here is I fitted a multinomial model where the response variable interested is type of work of the, it's basically couples, so the woman in the household against household income. So it goes and fits it. And you can see here what I do now is I, it's basically almost like two models. I get one model for your not working, and there's your intercept and your slope. Your part time, your intercept, and your slope. So for each of them, you can now do the calculations. But as well, to get the final one, it's basically the reference case. So it's like when we did categorical. It's just now, when we did categorical predictors in regression, you had a reference case in the predictors. Now we're doing a categorical in the response, and we have a reference case in the response. And in this case, it was full-time work that it chose to be the reference. Again, interpretation of them is difficult. So what I did is I did predictions. So what I've got here is for each possible income, I have the probability of part-time, not working full-time. And in this particular data, I mean, this is dated data now. So it was, I think, the 70s and 80s. You notice that as household income goes up, the probability that the woman in the household was in full-time work went down, while not working went up, and obviously part-time went up as well. So there's just an example of how I can take logistic regression and now do it for multinomial, using the multinom package. So one of the questions we can ask is how good is our prediction? We have got logistic regression and it can predict either probabilities and from the probabilities we could do a hard classification and predict whether it's a success or a failure. But how can we visualize this? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a thing called an ROC curve. So ROC is receiver operator characteristic. Okay. Um, if you're interested in this, and you should be, this paper by Tom Fawcett is probably the best one to go to. This is the paper I keep going back to. It's actually, most papers are rubbish. But every so often you get a paper that's just written really, really nicely. I believe this is one of them. I just like what it's done. It's one of the few ones that actually has the algorithms. And you can actually look at the algorithm and implement it straight off. In fact, luckily for you, you're going to have a chance to do that because you're going to implement the ROC algorithm from this paper in question four of the assignment. But before that, let's look at a confusion matrix. So what we've done here is we have various people out of stochastics and statistics. And for each one of them, we predicted their favorite pet and we actually asked them their favorite pet. So Lewis, we predicted cat, his favorite is cat. All the way, John O's rabbit, rabbit, Gary, cat, cat, blah, blah, blah. So you could look at this and you've got this hard classification. Notice my prediction gives you a level. It doesn't give you a probability, it just goes level. What, have I got one wrong? Yeah, no, your favorite pet would be none. None. Mm. Well, Gary, I remember once I had a thing where I had like people in the school and happiness score. And I just randomly gave people happiness score. And Gary, out of 10, had a happiness score of one. <laughs> Which would be fine if he didn't look at my lecture notes and phone me up and go, well, I've got a bloody happiness score of one. I don't know why it's become Liverpudlier, but well, I've only got blues. And I went, was it because you saw the table? And he went, oh yeah, fair enough. <laughs> it's just made of data, like, fuck off. <laughs> so the first thing you can do is you can do a confusion matrix. So what we've got with a confusion matrix is your rows are each of the levels you predicted, and your columns are the truth. 
the equivalent of the truth, okay? So ideally, your diagonals should have lots and lots of large numbers, and your off diagonals should be all zeros. That would be a perfect classifier, wouldn't it? Now often, we don't have that many things. Often we are looking at a success failure in our prediction, we collapse it down to a two by two. So your classic form would be something like this, where you predict cat, not cat, and your truth is cat, not cat. And in fact, this is the general form of the confusion matrix. It's a two by two, where you have, first of all, the condition is predicted to be positive, and then the condition is predicted to be negative. Then your truth is the true condition is positive and negative. So you've got these four measures. First of all, the ones on the diagonals are where you got it right. So you've got your TP, your true positive, where the truth is positive, you predicted positive, you got it right. Down here, you've got your true negative. The condition is negative, you predict negative, perfect. But there's two errors you can make. First of all, you can have a false positive. What did I do here? This is the case where the truth was the condition was negative, but we predicted positive. So it's a false positive. We've said it's positive falsely. False negative is now the condition where the actual condition was positive and we falsely said, no, actually it's negative. So these four things, TP, FN, FP, and TN, are our confusion matrix. And then everyone and his dog decided to take these and have a summary measure. So I went to Wiki and I gave you some of them to give you an idea. So the first thing is you may have heard of sensitivity and specificity. And what you need to do, and I advise you to go and go these one by one, is look at what this is doing. So what this is doing is TP over TP plus FN. So TP plus FN is saying of all the ones that are positive, how many true positives do I get? So your sensitivity is, if it's actually positive, what proportion of the time did I pick it up? What's specificity? Specificity says TNFP. So TNFP is of all the ones that were negative, what proportion of the time did I get it right? These are the classic one used in medicine. Sensitivity and specificity are used in medicine a hell of a lot of the time, especially when it comes to blood tests. Mm. Another one that you'll see a lot is the false positive rate. So now we've got FP over TN. So FP over TN. So of all the ones that are negative. Mm. Yeah, too far. What's the false positive? So how, of all the ones that were positive, how many times did I get it wrong? Yep. Yeah. Same with the true positive rate. The other one, there's precision recall. You've got precision, or PPV, which is TP over TP plus FN, which is, if you look at it, is the true positive rate. So they decided to give it another name. In fact, well, I'll get to a rant in a second, and your recall. Then some people did the accuracy, which is your diagonal over all the possibility. Some people did the F1 score, F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of the precision and sensitivity. But let's think about this. You have this single matrix you can calculate all your measures in that single matrix, and then from that you can have different measures. You can have sensitivity, specificity, TPR, FPR, that's all good. But that's assuming you had that nice little two by two matrix with the numbers, yeah? But let's think about that default. With the default, we had income and balance. And what I do is when I fit my model, I don't get whether you defaulted or not, I get a probability. So how do I convert a probability, which is a soft classification, into a default or not prediction, which is a hard classification? Well, you could choose a cutoff point. So I get my, you know, my list of predictions, and I can go, right, my cutoff is going to be, I'm going to be a little bit hard. If your probability of defaulting is 0.75 or more, I'll say you are predicted to default. If it's less, I will say that you're not going to default. 
So now I have what I predicted, I have what I observed in the data, I can make my little two by two confusion matrix, and I can calculate, in this case, I'm gonna calculate my TPR and my FPR. So there's my matrix, there's my values. But you might say, well, it's a bit harsh. Actually, 0.5 is a better cutoff point. And what you should find is, as my cutoff point comes down, I'm going to get the positives I should get more of the time. But of course, as the cut down goes down, I let more rubbish through. So my probability of false positive goes up. And you can go down and down. And you have this general relationship. So instead of having a single choice, we'd really like to sort of visualize that idea that I can have different cutoffs. And for each different cutoff, I'm going to have different false positive rates and true positive rates. And this is what we call our FOC curve. What you do is you put your false positive rates on the x-axis, your true positive rates on the y-axis, and for all your possible cutoffs, and so you don't take a grid of cutoffs, or what people usually do is all the unique values within your data set, each one of them you calculate your true positive rate, you calculate that two by two matrix, and then you get your true positive rate, your false positive rate, and you put a little dot, and then you just join them dots, and you get this. The idea is, let's say my predictor was useless. In that case, your probability of getting the true positive rate and the false positive rate will always be about the same, because you're just randomly selecting it. So if you were basically doing something as equivalent of tossing a coin, you would get a ROC curve that would lie on the y equals x axis. And in fact, the more it goes in that direction, the more it goes up here, the better your predictor. In fact, it's such a good measure of that, you will use the AUC, or area under the curve. The idea being, if it's along here, the area under the curve would be a half, as it gets bigger and bigger, it gets bigger and bigger. Anyone here who has Matt Rowan as a supervisor? Yeah, don't use AUC. Not unless you want to lose another two hours of a fucking rant. Because he says, ooh, 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 ignore it. But anyway, so you'll often find that the plots are actually much more informative. Every paper, like every paper wants a p-value whenever you collaborate. Every paper wants an AUC. You're not going to get past that. What are we doing? I might stop there. And next time we will talk about the ROC algorithm. So, Friday workshop, Monday we finish this. Any questions, come and see me. Your first assignment is due a week on Friday at 5 p.m. Uh, if you've got questions, Slack, etc. You should all have access to Canvas. You should all have access to the web page. If there's anything missing the web page, Slack me or email me. Thank you very much.